All right, well, <clears throat> I think I've done my last lawn mowing for the season. And uh, it's starting to gray out a little bit now. But when I was doing the lawn mowing, I, I was going along and all of a sudden, tonk! What was that? And I looked around, oh, that's a snake. <laughs> Chopped up the snake. <laughs> He's still moving around a bit, so I backed up on it. <laughs> oh boy. So we got a few of these little friendly characters coming out. Uh, and um, being out in the country, you see all sorts of sights like that. Uh, Seppi uh, took me outside uh, yesterday and she says, that looks like this, I, I think it might be a mole out there on the, on the path. And I went out there and, we, and I had a look at it and I said, hey, it's no mole. <laughs> it's the head of a possum. <laughs> <laughs> a head of a possum. <laughs> oh, well, anyway. <laughs> we get all sorts of things going on out there. <laughs> Let us pray. Our God and Father, we thank Thee for this time we've got together. And we pray for those who are unwell, Lord, and those who are suffering and seeing people suffering around them and questioning why these things happen. We pray, Lord, that uh, Your... Uh, spirit would work in their life and help them overcome uh, these doubts and difficulties that come and we ask these things in Christ's name amen okay well we're in this great book of revelation we're looking at an issue there is an issue in the bible and it relates to uh, this Babylon who or what is this Babylon and the more commentaries you'll read and if you take these commentaries very seriously the more confused you'll become. And so my attitude to this is you just uh, forget the commentaries and just dig into the scriptures. And the more you go into the scriptures and depend on them, the clearer things become. However, uh, I also acknowledge that the thing, the conclusion that I come to is in one sense kind of difficult to believe because if you look at the, uh, modern day Babylon, it's just a a piece of rubbish in the desert, you know, just sort of south uh, west of uh, Baghdad, and uh, it's just what is that? It's a nothing. It's uh, you know, uh, it has been. There's been an attempt to rebuild it, and it's halfway completed or quarter way completed, but it's that's it. You know, it's just a just a, a rubble of of a kind, and there's certainly no economic power to present day Babylon. And yet, if we are to see in the scriptures uh, the ancient Babylon to be revisited and become something powerful, then we've got to say, well, yes, in faith we believe it. You know, in faith we believe it. If you say that uh, Jerusalem is Babylon, well, that's much more believable in one sense, isn't it? Because it's up and running and, uh, well, yeah. I, we see it there, and it is, in that sense, a more believable option, in my, in my opinion, as a person that is not looking at prophecies, but looking at the present-day circumstances of Jerusalem. It does seem much more believable. It's not what I believe. And it's a, my, my position is much more difficult to believe. I acknowledge that. However, what I want to show is that, that there's good scriptural reasons for why... Um, I believe that Babylon is Babylon. Okay, so after that, um, chapter 17 and 18 are all about this uh, great time. I'm going to um, move things forward a little bit by using the slides to push things uh, past you and perhaps look at some of the passages uh, related to Babylon in the book of Revelation. Um, and so we've looked at some of these passages, and great judgment is coming on Babylon, this Babylon, as it says here in Revelation 18.10, standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, the great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. Um, and then down here in, in verse 21 of the same chapter, And a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. Now that's a problem. That, that's got to be a problem. If you think that Babylon is Jerusalem, that's a problem. 
And the more you read that and understand that, the more you see that identifying Jerusalem with Babylon is going to be difficult. <clears throat> Let me show you. Uh, we had been reading Zechariah just previously. So let's just find Zechariah. Okay. So on one hand, I want you to don't go out of Revelation because that's going to be something we need to just pop back to. But just go to uh, Zechariah and chapter 14, which is the last chapter of Zechariah. Um, and this is such a fantastic chapter. It's really worthwhile reading the thing completely. We won't do it now, but I'll pick out a few verses. Because look at what in verse 1 what it says. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh. Bang. The day of the Lord. Well, the book of Revelation has a lot to do with the day of the Lord. This is when the Lord has his day. We're in man's day, man's judgment. Man is thumbing his nose at God, and God is not zapping them immediately. We've got people saying there is no God, and if there's a God, judge me now. People will be saying all that sort of thing. And they'll say, see, there's no God, because if there was a God, they would zap me now. Well, wait a minute. God, in all his graciousness, is allowing that man has his day. And this is not a proof of God's non-existence. But rather, this is a proof of God's grace. And that is remarkably the day in which we are living. A time of tremendous grace where man has got his judgment, right? He's got his way for the moment. But God is going to have his day. And then when God has his day, man, you ain't going to thumb your nose at God like that and think you're going to get away with it. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee, for I will gather all nations against Jerusalem. Bingo! Here comes Jerusalem. It's now an important part of God's prophecy in terms of practical outworking of things. Jerusalem has always been an important part of God's prophecy. When Jesus came, there was a Jerusalem. It was the center of what Jesus was doing in many respects. It was there. But it was also the time of the Gentiles. There were Romans marching through the land. And many people wanted Jesus to say, okay, put down your rule now and let's see all of these Romans put aside. And we want to see God's kingdom put on this earth. And no, Jesus would not do that. He would not do that because... Things had to happen first. One thing is that their heart had to be changed. Jesus needed to go to the cross at Calvary and die for the sins of the world. And he needed to see his people repent and come to God from a repentant heart. Not from a point of arrogancy and power. But rather, first of all, with a changed heart. That's what he wanted first. The heart must be changed first. And to try and... Push that aside. No, that's not God's way. But there's coming a time when Jerusalem is going to be right at the center of what God's doing. And it says here, um, verse 2, For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and its houses rifled, and the women ravished. And half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. And it says... Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. And then he'll go forth, you see. There's going to be this great battle. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives. Ooh. This is a remarkable statement. Which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the, mountain of, the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north, and half of it toward the south. Man, this thing splits in half. One half towards the north, and one half towards the south, and it says a very great valley intervenes. Now, isn't it interesting, if you just hold your place here in Zechariah, and just look at uh, Revelation 16.
verse 18. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. And the great city was divided in three parts, and the cities uh, into three parts. And the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon came in rem remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine and fierceness of his wrath. And every island fled away, and the mountains were, were not found. And it's, it, you notice that there's a great earthquake, and in verse 19 it says, And the cities, plural, the cities of the nations fell. It's interesting to me that w when Christ comes back, there is this great split that occurs in the Mount of Olives. Could it be that this coincides with this great earthquake? And there is this great movement of the earth's crust that occurs in this great valley. I'm not saying it is. I'm just saying... Could it be that this, this is going to happen at the same time? Okay, and now going back to Zechariah, and you might say, well, okay, therefore Jerusalem is destroyed, right? It must be massively destroyed when this happens. Because it's got to be destruction when this earthquake occurs. It's a massive earthquake. And it says this in verse 5, And you shall flee to the, the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azel, Yea, you shall flee like as you fled from bef before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah. See, this is why I think this is very interesting that the earthquake is mentioned here in the days of Uzziah. And we have a prophecy in Revelation 16 that there's going to be this massive earthquake. And when Christ comes back to the Mount of Olives, the thing splits in half. Well, you could say, yeah, that's just Christ. It's his miraculous entry into the world and he will cause this thing. Yeah, okay, I agree that he does cause it, but what about the earthquake? Do you think that's part of all this? Isn't it a possibility that what actually initiates this earthquake that goes shattering around all the earth is actually Christ's return? He actually comes back and on his return and when his feet hit the Mount of Olives, wrap around the earth. Round the earth, man. All the cities. Feel it. Don't you think that's an interesting prospect? It's a pretty interesting prospect. Um, and people who want to deny the existence of Christ? No, no, no. You may want to blaspheme. You may want to say all sorts of things against Christ and God. But his existence will become a visual reality. <laughs> oh, man. And it says this in Zechariah. I mean, this is so fascinating to me. You know, this is just a fascinating thing. But I, what I want you to do is I want you to think about Jerusalem. Okay, if, if Jerusalem is Babylon, then we know from the prophecies that we read just here in 1821, it has to be destroyed and it's gone. We can read more passages from, from Jeremiah 50 and Isaiah 13. That, it, that it's just going to be no more and it'll be destroyed as like uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. Gone. Well, then what about Jerusalem? What's going to happen here to Jerusalem? Well, if you go across a little bit further down, it says this in verse 16, just to cut to the chase. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Well, where, were the, where was the Feast of Tabernacles to be kept? Well, in Jerusalem. Look at the next verse. And it shall be that whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem. Now, it's got to be damaged. I agree. It has to be damaged. But it's extant. It's there, right? And... It, they are the, the nations are to come up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. Those people who will not obey this command, they suffer consequences. People that talk about the, the millennial reign of Christ like it's all going to be like the Garden of Eden, forget the locality of the promises. 
there is a very strict locality for this Edenic type promise that Isaiah talks about, the sheep and the lamb and all this sort of stuff. It's, it's a very close locality. But man, those nations that are not obedient to God, wham, they get it. They get it. It's not all nice, lovey-dovey, peace and trans tranquility. You're going to go with no rain if you start messing with God. And it says this in verse 18, And if the family of Egypt go not up and come not and have no rain, there shall be the plague. <laughs> what do you think? How's the millennium shaping up? And it says this, Wherewith the Lord will smite the heathen that come not up to keep the feast of tabernacles. Well, because this is like another blasphemy and rejection of his reality. And he won't put up with it. It's not like today where people can do this and you can get away with it. Not so here. No, 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 no. Not going to happen. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Of course, that means Jerusalem is there. It's the hub of what's going on during the millennium. Well, that can't be Babylon. Because Babylon is to be totally and utterly destroyed. You get the point I'm making? Okay, so that's kind of interesting. The other reason why, and I'm just elaborating on this again, I'm not going to run the passages because it's going to be flip-flop, flip-flop. You need to do it yourself. There's just a complete line-up between the prophecies of Babylon and what you read in Revelation. Almost the same exact wording is used. If you look at the word Babylon, it's used 17 times in the books of the Bible. And it'll be 18 books if you in include the word Babel. And the major occurrence is 141 times in the book of Jeremiah, which I've been pointing you to. If you read 1 Peter 5.13, it says this, The church that is at Babylon. Now, wait a minute. If the prophecies that relate to Babylon have been fulfilled, and Babylon was destroyed way back there, and that's it, and they're all been fulfilled, the church is at, that is at Babylon, what's it doing there? What's this church doing at Babylon? Now, the way people get around this little item is to say that the word Babylon here is a mystic term. <laughs> the church which is at Babylon, meaning a mystic idea of any church that is involved with mystic ideas, etc. It's a wavy wave on the sea. Or some will say this is Babylon in Egypt. It's a little town in Egypt. Etc. All sorts of things going on with this word Babylon to try and get around it. But for my reading, why should we do that? Why can't we just allow the word to remain exactly as it always has been? It's a town in uh, the, the land of the Chaldees. So that appears there. If you look at this Revelation 17.5, which we've been reading, and upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery. Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and abominations of the earth. Well, the mother of harlots would mean, therefore, it's the source of something evil and bad, spiritual adultery. And if you look at Babylon and you get the book, The, uh, the Two Babylons by Hislop, it's, I mean, it's no, there's no difficulty whatsoever in assigning to the ancient place of Babylon being the source of all kinds of mischief. No problem at all. But what this will mean is this Babylon will be revived and will once again bring up all of its mystery, religious ideas and be very, very influential with people. 1780, and the woman which thou sawest is that great city. Now, Jerusalem is called a great city, but I showed you that New Jerusalem is also a great city. And you're not going to say that New Jerusalem is Babylon. Right. There's no way you're going to say that. So just because it says great city is not a mark for Jerusalem being Babylon 
if it was, and so is New Jerusalem, which reigneth over the kings of the earth. There is the mystery of it. The mystery of this is that it reigns over all the kings of the earth. And this will be at the time of the end. If you look at the history of Babylon, one of the great Amorite kings called Hammurabi, uh, he established a king kingdom in Babylon, and it was very influential, extremely influential. And you would have heard, no doubt, of the Code of Hammurabi, a code which goes back before, as far as we understand, before the time of Moses. And there you'll find all sorts of codes, which in some cases are very similar to what you find in a Moses code. At the time, later on, uh, after that time of Hammurabi, sometime after that, there was the Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar had a massive empire centered there. And it had huge influence. During that time, Nebuchadnezzar constructed the Hanging Gardens. It's uh, pretty certain that that's the case. And there have been basically seven wonders of the world. These are they. The Great Pyramid, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, the Statue of Zeus, the Temple of Artemis, Mausoleum of Halicarnassus, the Colossus of Rhodes, and the Lighthouse of Alexandria. All of them are gone, except for the pyramid. They're all gone. And so these were great things to be seen in the ancient world. And various uh, historians talked about them. And so did Herodotus. Uh, you can go to this website and read more about this. It's very interesting. Now I'm showing you this picture just because it's kind of an interest to me. Uh, when many, many years ago, when there was in fact an East and West Berlin, to get to the east side, you had to go through this checkpoint. Well, it's kind of hilarious now, but it was no joke then. It was no joke. Uh, this was quite a serious matter, and you really felt like you were taking your life in your own hands to go through this thing. Because what you'd do is you'd go in as a, as a tour group, and they'd take you off the bus. These, that is, once you go into the Russian side, they'd take you off the bus and they would literally line you up against a wall. And then they'd search you, and they'd go through your documents, they get a great big mirror, and they put it under the bus, they go through the interior of the bus, check it all out, and then finally, if you're lucky, you will carry on your way, and you'd go and see some of the sites in East Berlin. When you, go in, when you went into East Berlin, there were parts of Berlin which the Russians would not touch. They said, no, we're not going to touch this, we're not going to... We're not going to repair this. This is going to be like a uh, museum, a visual museum. You can see what happened during the war. So you go through this, and there's just a bombed out ruins of places of the city. And then what they'd do is they would uh, take you to some of the museums. There's a museum called the Museum of Pergamon, which was in East Germany. And in there... There were some remarkable things. Now, of course, you can go there freely. It's now, of course, it's all united, and you can, you can just go there freely. But I stood there during the time when this was in East Germany. And it's remarkable, the beauty of these things. Uh, the Ishtar Gate. And you say to yourself, wait a minute, this is supposed to be way, way back, you know, 600 BC, and these people can build these things? With, with beautiful ceramics and color and oh it's absolutely beautiful and this is just one portion of this gate to uh, the Ishtar gate it was a massive thing this is one of the models that was constructed to show you what uh, Nebuchadnezzar had done so uh, just asking the question could this be Jerusalem Babylon must be destroyed suddenly plenty of passages show that one hour. Never happened. It never happened in the past. Therefore, it should happen in the future. You don't find this in the history of Babylon. It's not destroyed in one hour. There's all sorts of destructions in the history of Babylon, but it doesn't happen in one hour. And furthermore, it's, it's not completely destroyed. 
There's the time when Alexander came through and he, he remarked and he told his soldiers, he says, don't mess with the people here. I don't want you messing with the people. He was so impressed with the city that he didn't want it touched. And he even looked at this great big tower, which many think is the remains of the Tower of Babel. And he's, he, was, he looked at it and he said, oh, it's, it's, it's fallen down and it's not really representing its original grandeur. So what he told them to do is totally destroy it and then we'll rebuild it to its original magnificence. That was Alexander's idea. Well, he pulled it down and then he never rebuilt it. But it was, a, according to him, it was a magnificent place. So what I'm saying is it has never been destroyed in one hour. And even today, there are remains there. Okay, so burn with fire, you'll find that. Babylon must be destroyed by an earthquake. We find that in, uh, in this passage in chapter 16, which we just read. Okay, does this fit with Jerusalem? It doesn't. Look at this. Here's a passage from Ezekiel. Ezekiel 5.5. 5. And this refers to historical events which had happened with Nebuchadnezzar when he came into Jerusalem. Thus saith the Lord God, this is Jerusalem. I have set it in the midst of the nations and countries that are round about her. Down in verse 9, and I will do in thee that which I have not done, and whereunto I will not do any more the like, because of all thine abominations. Now that means in this context, when Nebuchadnezzar came into Jerusalem, he did some damage under the inspiration of God. He did some damage to Jerusalem because of their wayward activities. They got some judgment. But he's saying it's not going to happen again. But if Jerusalem is Babylon, it's got to happen, right? And in a far worse way. See, it's, it, this won't fit with that idea. So I've got some questions you know, that you need to ask. If Jerusalem is destroyed in history past... Then what of the New Testament Jerusalem? Where did it come from? What is the nature of God's attitude to the disobedient of Israel in general? And then we can think about Jerusalem. Because when there's judgment on Jerusalem, there's primarily judgment on the people. And then the, the architecture of the town, of course, would come second. But it's primarily a judgment against people. And if you look through, say, like Ezekiel 11, it talks about this tremendous judgment. Ye have multiplied your slain in the city. Ye have filled the streets thereof with the slain. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, your slain whom you have laid in the midst of it, they are the, the flesh, and this city is the cauldron. But I will bring you forth out of the midst of it. Oh, so what you get in here is you get judgment, but you also get the promise of bringing them back. Therefore, say, thus saith the Lord God, although you get these kind of Bring backs. Although I have cast them far off uh, among the heathen, although I have scattered them among the country, yet will I be to them as a little sanctuary. You get this through Ezekiel. You get that, yes, they have been disobedient, and he smashes them. But not completely. And not without a little light at the end of the tunnel. Although, yet, you know, I will be to them a sanctuary. Therefore, say, thus saith the Lord God, I will even gather you from the people. See now? It's not a complete destruction. It's, yes, judgment, but then a bringing them back. A remnant bringing them back. You know? Uh, same with uh, Ezekiel 14. For thus saith the Lord God, how much more when I send my four sword judgments upon... See, judgments upon the sword and the famine, the noise and beast. Yet! Whoops. <laughs> Yet, behold, therein shall be left a remnant. You see, again, it's always light. There's a smashing of Jerusalem, yet. Ezekiel 16. You want to read this one. Ezekiel 16. 59. For thus saith the Lord God, I will even deal with thee as thou hast done, which has despised the oath and breaking the covenant. These are covenant breakers. These are the whores. Broken the covenant with God. Gone against Jehovah. Judgment comes. But look, verse 60. Nevertheless, nevertheless, I will remember my covenant 
I made a promise. And even though you've broken your part of the deal, nevertheless, this is what we find. Promises. So what I see as I go through Ezekiel, yes, I do find judgment coming on Jerusalem. But it's not final. Jer Jerusalem is still there. And it's symbolically shown in the, in the case of this wife who has committed adulteries and yet Jehovah says, yet, nevertheless, I will remember my side of the bargain. So it's kind of interesting. You can read through Jeremiah 50. Uh, the children of Israel and the children of Judah were oppressed together and all that took them captives held them fast. They refused to let them go. Their Redeemer is strong. The Lord of hosts is his name. He shall... Truly plead their cause that he may give rest to the land and disquiet the inhabitants of Babylon. Babylon's going to get hit and those of the land, the promised land, they will be kept, preserved. Here's a, here's a big passage. Therefore the wild beasts of the desert with the wild beasts of the island shall dwell there and the owls that shall dwell therein and it shall be no more inhabited. This is Babylon. Forever, neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation. As God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah and the neighbor cities thereof, saith the Lord, so shall no man abide there, neither shall any son of man dwell therein. So that's what's going to happen to Babylon when it finally gets this judgment. It hasn't happened yet. Therefore, it has to be built. It must be gathered again into some powerful nation and city and then finally suffer judgment. And here I'm just pointing out again that same, but Jerusalem shall be safely inhabited. You see? Again, judgment, yes. Massive earthquakes, yes. North, south, Mount of Olives, Great Valley, yes. All of these things happening. But Jerusalem shall be safely inhabited. Right? I mean, I think it's relatively clear. I think it's relatively clear that it can't be Jerusalem. Well, that's my talk for you today. I hope it's given you something to think about. Next time what we're going to do is we're going to go right through chapter 18 and we'll begin in 19 next time. Chapter 19. I hope these studies are taking you further in your understanding of the book of Revelation. They've certainly have been helping me. Let us pray. Our God and Father, we thank Thee again for this opportunity to read and understand more of the scriptures and what has been shown. Lord, we ask that uh, as we consider that light would come and that we would be used of thee to witness to others of the great truth of salvation by grace, the right division of the scriptures and the fact of life through resurrection. In the person of Jesus Christ, we have life everlasting. We thank thee in his name. Amen.